Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Case for Christianity class. We are in our third session of a difficult topic on the problem of evil, and we've been looking at um, some background to that topic and noting that it's probably the number one question that most people ask about life in general, but um, ask of Christians, because we see the problem of evil all around us and we stop and we wonder why God, you know, and many um, a hardcore atheists have used this as the number one reason they don't believe in God. But when you really think through that line of thinking um, and you, you kind of wrestle with that topic, you realize that God is the only answer to the problem of evil. God is the solution. And he's provided this life manual for us that we know as the Bible that helps us to understand this, this dilemma. You know, if God, if you're there, why are you allowing me to go through suffering? And why are you allowing evil that we see in this world? And if you remember, we talked a little bit about it the last couple of weeks in the fact that those who are uh, skeptics, those who are leveling accusations against God, don't understand that God is doing something about it, that he has put in motion a rescue plan for us. And the, the word that's left out is, yes, there's evil and we don't see God, you know, wiping that out, but we forget a big word yet, yet. And if you know the Christian story, you know that God has the final say in this, in this evil world that we live in. And as Christians, if we've studied the scriptures and we understand the teachings of Jesus, we know that Jesus has that final final hand in ending the suffering, the evil permanently. And for those who follow him and believe, we can take comfort in that. And that is our hope. And, and that is the thing, that is the good news that we want to share with others. And so as we take a look at um, the topic tonight, that's going to conclude our discussion on the problem of evil um, and again, if you've missed any of that, you can go back and view the previous classes. Um, we're going to look at faith versus doubt and talk a little bit about uh, some people who've struggled with that as well. We all have. We all have. I mean, that that's really where my journey began. And even though along the way I haven't had, uh, it's not like I haven't had trials and and sufferings and things I have. The difference is that I've been able to, to look to the Lord and have that hope and promise and assurance that he's going to finish finish what he's promised. And that for all, those of us who believe, we know we can take Jesus' hand and walk through those times of difficulties, trusting in him that he has provided that, that final solution and our eternal home in heaven. And so let me open us in prayer and we'll get into this topic for this evening. All right, if you'd join me. Father, thank you for, man, thank you for just being there when we walk through times of trials, times of suffering, times where we see evil all around and we, and we stop and we ask why and we ask, you know, what help us, you know, we just, we cry out. And we thank you for, being there for us. We thank you for providing that peace that passes all understanding because that's in your in your word. And you you've made so many promises for us that we can grab a hold to and that we can walk with you through these times of difficulties. And so we thank you for that. Um please help us to have not only that confidence when we go through these trials and difficulties but also to be people who are compassionate and willing to 
be there for others who are going through those kinds of things as well. And we thank you and we pray that you you give us your words when we share with others. And we know that the Holy Spirit, you're the one that works through us and helps us. And also as we're learning things, please be our teacher and guide. Most of all, we thank you, Jesus, for fulfilling everything that you said you were going to do and that you did on that cross and in your resurrection. And we're so grateful for you and for doing all of that for us. And we thank you. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. Thanks. I'm going to share my screen. Um, just a second. All right. So this week, session three, the problem of evil, part three. And this week, we're going to focus on this topic of faith versus doubt. But before we do that, as we do each week, I want you to take a few minutes and don't forget the importance of prayer. So if you're doing this study with other people, make sure you take some time to do prayers, um, hit pause, but also do the review. We've been working on um, these two things over the last couple of weeks, the categories for the 39 books of the Old Testament and the books within each. And so that's just a memory practice for you. And then also the apologetics roadmap. I think that's a good thing to have in your back pocket along with, and you don't necessarily have to have those discussions right now with answers because you could be, you could be hours doing that. But just knowing what are those 10 questions that are ones that are important to have a grasp of in discussing your faith with other people. And then being able to find, you know, a couple answers that that you can use that'll help you in conversation with others who might be asking one or more of those questions of you. So take a few minutes, hit pause, come on back. And I've got one more thing for you to do with your groups as well. All right. I wanted to add, you'll notice there's not a memory verse on this slide. I wanted to add that and keep it up there for the next couple of weeks. Um, and so the memory verse for this week, actually verses, there's two of them there, is part of um, the introduction to uh, the armor of God. And we talked about this um, in class, I think it was last week, and looking at the importance of using this as a prayer tool and also something that you can read if you don't have it memorized in those times of trials and difficulties because really what we need to understand is that while we're here on this earth and in this world it, it's a spiritual battle it's a spiritual battle it's it's not one that is between you and another physical person it's a spiritual battle and i think this particular passage if you read it in its entirety ephesians chapter 6 you might want to read the whole chapter as a matter of fact but what I tried to do was put the introduction there for memory, and, and let's read it together right now, and then you can work on it the next um, few weeks as well. So it says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of, the, of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And that's Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. And then it goes into telling us how to put on the full armor of God. And so what I did, instead of saying, memorize that whole passage um, of verses, is to break down what those, what those things are asking us to put on. In other words, to really pray about and focus on. And so if you could remember these seven things to go along with your memory verse would be really helpful. And so number one would be the belt of truth, knowing that God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And knowing that we can find the truth of God in the word of God, um, the breastplate of righteousness. This is the kind of people we should be, living upright lives and trusting the Lord to guide us in that type of life. And number three, this one is so important, I think, in terms of when we're going through struggles and difficulties and, and sufferings is feet fitted with the gospel of peace, just praying for that peace, that shalom that God can provide for us. 
Number four, shield of faith, having faith. And, you know, I, I want to say one of the big things about faith, when I remember back when I was becoming a, a Christian and giving my life to the Lord, um, you know, I didn't want to have that blind faith. So faith for me is all about the trust that I have in what God has said in his word, what he's done, what he's fulfilled already, and the things that he's promised that he will do. And, and my, so my faith is grounded in knowing those things and trusting those things. And so I think having faith in God is not a blind faith. It's a trust in him and what he said he will do for us. Number five, helmet of salvation. If you are born again, you have that assurance of salvation. Born again, you know, if you're new to that, it's not some magical thing or any, any stuff like that. It's just understanding the fact that we are all born into sin. And so for me to say to, you know, God or anyone else, hey, this is just the way I am. Um, I was born this way, or this is just how I am. That needs to be corrected because that's a spiritual issue. That's where the born again needs to come in. Yes, I was, I am this way. It is a sinful way and I need to be born again. In other words, I need to give it to the Lord. I need to trust in Jesus and be born again in the spiritual sense. And so that's important to understand. And so salvation is, is you know, we could take confidence. I've talked to friends of mine that I, that and people I know that are Christians that say, well, I hope I'm going to heaven. That shouldn't be a question mark. That should be an assurance. Because when Jesus said that it is done, it is finished, that means when he was on the cross, that he has taken all of our sins upon him. There is nothing that we can do to get ourselves to that eternal home and into that spiritual place that we need to be of born again. He's done it for us. If we trust in him, we can have that. And he proved that by resurrecting from the grave and defeat of death. And so that's it. There's not, it's not about, well, I hope I'm good enough or I hope I've done enough good things understand that is not what it's all about and if it was then jesus didn't need to go to the cross for us because he went for us so that we wouldn't have to follow laws and rules and regulations and be good enough we'll never get there we will never be good enough i'll never be good enough so i stand behind jesus because i know that he took that for me and so have that helmet of salvation on for protection the sword of the spirit, that's the only offensive weapon. All of these are defensive, by the way. The word of God is the offensive weapon. The sword of the spirit, the word of God. Um, and if, the more we know the word of God, the more that we can use that as a defense, as, as an offense, I should say, um, in our world and against those spiritual forces. And pray in the spirit on all occasions, it tells us. So prayer is part of that that battle, that power that we can have um, as Christians against, against these evil forces in the world. And so I think we just have to recognize that this is something we should probably read often and commit to memory. Um, if you can memorize that whole passage, that's even better. But I just thought I'd break it down for you there. So let's work on that the next few weeks, and that'll be part of our opening review and discuss. All right, so let's get into the topic um, this evening um, on faith versus doubt. Um, and I want to, um, again, just review quickly the apologetics roadmap and that we are finishing up with uh, number five this week and we'll get into number six next week. Um, so if God exists, then why is there evil and suffering in the world, the problem of evil? And this is a problem that many people have struggled with, including um, prominent Christians. And I wanted to talk a little bit about these, these two gentlemen here. You may or may not recognize one or both of them. Um, but, but just think about this. When, when you have doubts, what, what do you do when you have doubts about God or your faith or things like that? Doubts and questions can be a good thing. If it moves us forward in our faith into finding answers, a lot of people, even Christians, a lot of Christians have doubts about their faith. And, you know, if they don't do anything with those doubts, they can they can become 
very like soured on, on Christianity. They can become soured about their life. They can become skeptical. Doubts can be a terrible thing if it, if it causes us to settle into skepticism, apathy. A lot of people settle into apathy, almost agnosticism, or even worse, some people walk away from the, from the faith. So what do we do with our questions and doubts? You know, do we just like kind of hide behind them, run away from, from them, like run away from God, like Jonah did in the Bible? Or can we make a choice to move forward and find answers? We want to look at these two people who made two different choices, resulting in drastically different outcomes. The one on the, the left there is Charles Templeton, and you may or may not know who he is. Versus Billy Graham, and most of most people, whether you're a Christian or not, know Billy Graham, his name. And so, Lee Strobel, um, a few years back, came out with with a book. This was after his Case for Christ. Um, he had several different uh, books and and video studies and documentaries on these topics. I would highly recommend, and I think you can go on YouTube and watch it his case for faith, the film, um, and watch that on uh, a stream it somehow. I'm pretty sure on YouTube, you can get it. And this is, I think, a phenomenal presentation dealing with the problem of evil and suffering and looking at people. He does interviews. He goes and he interviews Charles Templeton, who I'll talk about in just a second, um, before he died back in, I think, 1999, somewhere around there, somewhere around the turn of the century. And he interviews him. But also in this documentary that runs about, I think it's a little over an hour, he interviews people who've gone through horrible things in their lives, but yet never lost their faith. Um, people like um, Johnny Erickson Tata, if you're familiar with her, um, you know, she was in a, a diving accident um, back when she was about 16 years old and became a quadriplegic. She's now, I believe, in her 60s, maybe 70s. And her ministry has been phenomenal. Um, she actually says she wouldn't trade her chair for anything in the world for the ministry that she's had. I, I can't believe that she can actually say that, but she can. And she's had such a profound effect on millions of people around the world through her ministry, um, sharing her story and helping those who are in similar situations as she is, whether quadriplegic or some other disability, she's been a strong force for God. And she shares her faith with people around the world. She's done a lot. So Johnny Erickson Tata is in that, that film. Um, but Charles Templeton, kind of the opposite of this, Charles Templeton was an evangelist with Billy Graham, I think in the early 50s, maybe late 40s, early 50s. And they were there was a team of them that would go out around the world actually sharing their faith. But Charles Templeton started to struggle with his faith. As you may have heard some Christians today that have walked away from their faith, have struggled with faith, Charles Templeton did. Charles Templeton was set to become the number one evangelist worldwide instead of Billy Graham back in those days. So it's an interesting story, an interesting documentary um, that I'm going to encourage you to watch. I'm going to show part of it in our live class, but I can't do it online here, but I'm just going to encourage you um, to watch it and, and kind of see um, Lee Strobel's interview with him and some of the things that he talked about. Now, what Charles Templeton did was he he ended up walking away from the faith. He even wrote books, you know, why I became an atheist, that kind of thing. Um, and he walked away, whereas, you know, Billy Graham became, you know, a world's most influential evangelist um, in a positive way for many people around the world. So I just wanted to review some things about that I had as takeaways when I read this book and watched watched this film about Charles Templeton, that might help you a little bit or in sharing with somebody. And these are the things that I can see where Charles Templeton went wrong. And one thing for sure, his prayer life was questionable and he struggled with his doubts. He never once said that he prayed over his doubts, nor did he give them to God in his interview. He talked about 
how he struggled and he felt guilty and he knew he was letting people down and his own personal story about, you know, being, having, I don't know, like 600 bucks in his pocket. And that was all he had. And he left, um, you know, he went on to become an author and, and his life basically was given to writing kind of against Christianity. Um, but he never talked about praying over these problems. He, he went to Princeton for help. He thought maybe I go and get my theological, you know, degree but Princeton was becoming a very liberal leaning seminary, you know, even back then. And he only had his doubts reinforced. Um, he did not make God's word, the Bible, his first priority and the ultimate authority. And so instead of going, running to God in prayer, opening God's word and really learning and studying it, he was a young kid. I think, I don't know if he was even 20 when he, when he first started doing evangelism. I could be wrong. He might've been, but I think he was very young and um, he, he didn't know the scriptures. He didn't really know them. Even Billy Graham, I, I once heard say he wished he had studied the scriptures deeper. And that's a man who I always have thought knew the scriptures very well, which just goes to show us we can never, ever know everything about the scriptures. It's a lifetime commitment. We should just keep on doing um, he did not allow for Jesus' sacrifice to be personal for him. And so that was another thing. He did not persevere through his trials, trusting outcomes to God. Instead, he was trusting in his own feelings. Feelings are a huge problem for us humans because we tend to run with our feelings. And feelings are very deceptive. And so I think in understanding that we need a firm foundation to stand on when we have those kinds of feelings, we can run back to what we know to be true and stand on that and trust. He gave up and walked away from God. I think it's important to note God didn't leave him. He left God. He said he walked away. And one of the things that stuck out to me in the interview, again, I hope you watch the documentary on this, the film, um, is at the very end of his interview with, with Lee Strobel, Charles Templeton said, I miss Jesus. He, he made that comment. He missed Jesus. Well, Jesus is what it's all about. And I just pray and hope that at the end of his life, he reached back out to Jesus because I know Jesus would be there if he called on him. Well, what about Billy Graham? Billy Graham had doubts as well. Billy Graham, Templeton's really good friend, I think even up to the end, they were still friends, did become the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. When Billy Graham suffered through times of doubt, and he did, he went out, and Billy Graham talked about this a lot, he would go out to a quiet place, he would open up his Bible and ask God to help him. And through prayer and the study of God's word, Billy Graham became a role model for millions and though he is now with his Lord and Savior in his eternal home, his legacy will live on forever. It'll continue forever. Billy Graham was, I, I, to me, very influential to me in the very early days of my Christian walk. I thought he was pretty amazing in his teachings. I loved his humbleness about his lifestyle. He never lived off the riches of like, you know, some famous evangelists do. He never lived off of those riches. He always used the money to increase either, you know, his ministry or missions or um, places for people and stuff. It was never for him. He lived a fairly modest, modest life. Um, some of the things that Billy Graham did and got right, he was honest with God about his doubts. He went to God and said, look, this is why I'm doubting. He put prayer first. So, you know, going to God in prayer, he put prayer first instead of his feelings. He put God's word, the Bible, as the ultimate authority in his life. He put Jesus' life examples and teaching as ultimate truth. That was what he was trying to model, was Jesus' life. He put Jesus' sacrifice as sufficiency for the needed grace in his life. Grace, wow, is so important, especially when we're struggling and when we fail and when we stumble. Um, we pray for God's grace to please pick us back up and keep us going. He persevered with God through those trials relying on the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And he never gave up and walked away from God, no matter how hard life got. 
He trusted God's purpose for his life here. And I think most importantly, he had his eyes on eternity. He knew where he was going and what he was looking ahead to. And I think that is so very important for us to understand. Well, the result of Billy Graham's life, if you don't know about him, he has a legacy that lives on through his family. And you can find Christian service through that family all over the world. Franklin Graham's um, Samaritan's Purse comes to mind. Um, and through those who have listened to his preaching over the last century, he's a influenced so many people in a positive way to help others and to share the gospel. He has been a warrior for the kingdom of God and an instrument for the salvation of so many. His faithfulness and com commitment to God has been awe-inspiring. And, you know, as far as I know, almost all of his family, kids, grandkids, and, and others, um, siblings and whatnot are in the ministry in some form or another. And I think that's a testament to his life. So what about, what does the Bible have to say about doubting our faith or when we struggle with uncertainties and what to do and sufferings? There are three specific examples in the New Testament um, that I wanted to put down and share where individuals had doubts. And it's pretty amazing if, if you think about uh, a couple of these guys that were with Jesus, you know, and then they had doubts. And so the way that they that they responded, if you if you look at John the Baptist, and I'm going to read these, you can look up these scriptures if you want. But in Matthew 11, verses two to six, John the Baptist was in, he had been arrested. He was in prison, soon to be beheaded. Um and he was having some doubts. And it's and so the scripture says here, Matthew 11, 2, when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. Now, this is from the Old Testament. Jesus is quoting so that John would know that these things are being fulfilled. He says this, he says, tell John, the blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And this, so that's the way Jesus answered John's doubts. Now, John had, had baptized Jesus. He had seen the dove, you know, descend on Jesus, the Holy Spirit. He had seen uh, other things before he had been arrested himself. Yet here's a man in prison wondering, am I right? Is this the guy? Now, the importance of what Jesus told him was that John knew, John the Baptist knew the Old Testament. So he knew what the Messiah was going to do. And so Jesus gave him that assurance through evidence of what he had done so that John would be assured. How about the man whose son was demon possessed? There was a man that brought his son to Jesus for healing. Um, and I'll read that as well. They brought the boy to him, to Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, threw the boy into a convulsion. And falling the, to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he, asked his, and he asked his father, Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, this is what I love right here, this emphasis. I do believe. Help my unbelief. I love it. When he when he saw when Jesus saw that the crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you to come out of him and do not enter him again. After crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. So Jesus, again, he he just responded. He didn't he didn't correct these, these men who were having these doubts. He even told that guy, I mean, that guy even said, help me with my unbelief. And what did Jesus do? He did. Now, what about Thomas? Jesus' own disciple, Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas, you know, for a lot of reasons. This is one of them. So this is um, 
this is at the end of, of John, and this is after the resurrection. And, and so I'm going to read that passage there. But Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And this is talking about the resurrection. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. <laughs> after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said, I'm sorry, then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your fingers and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put in my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Listen to this. This is for us. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So that's John you know, chapter 20, 24 to 31. Those are, I think, amazing examples of, of um, Jesus dealing with people who had doubts and people who believed in him, people who were saved because of Jesus. Jesus never made them feel bad or foolish. He always answered their questions and gave evidence for what he said. I think that's pretty cool. So keep that in mind when you have doubts and you want to go to God and ask, ask him. I love what Simon Peter said about, you know, when Jesus had said, you know, who do you say that I am? And, the, and I think this is where I could be wrong if that's where that is. But Simon Peter, you know, I think, okay, I think the story is, and I should have got the context, so I apologize. You can you can read it if you want to get the context. But I think people had left um, Jesus, and Jesus says to them, so are you guys all going to leave too, basically, is what's, I think, going on here. And Simon re Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. That's an amazing statement of faith from Peter. And, and you know, I kind of, I feel that way myself. It's like, to whom else am I going to go for help? The world doesn't offer me any help when I'm suffering, doubting, or, or grieving. The world doesn't offer me any help, but the Lord does. Who else am I going to go to? I can't go to, you can't always rely on friends and relatives and other people because sometimes they're just not there for you. And sometimes God does use them to help you. And I believe that too. But we need to go to the Lord first. So to whom shall we go? I just want to emphasize the importance of prayer in all of this. Um, and this is this is about Jesus. and Because Jesus would go out and pray all the time. Vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. That's in Luke 5, 15 and 16. Um, Jesus made sure that he spent that time alone with him and the Father. That would give him encouragement, comfort, and, you know, the ability to move forward. So how do we live as Christians in a world of evil and suffering? So, first of all, we need to understand we have an opportunity to be part of God's team and help win battles here in this life. Jesus will take care of the final war. We know that. To do this, we must have the right tools. And I think the tools that we need to be working on on a daily basis is prayer, hermeneutics, apologetics, discipleship. Remember, that was in the ministry statement. And so we'll just break that down. Become a proficient prayer warrior. You know, that that idea of being a, a, a person that prays every single day and, and through every single thing that you go through. I know it's hard. You get busy in the day and, and it's it's easy for us to just like forget to pray or forget to ask God to help us. But I think the more that we put God first and ask him to help us in everything we do, spend some time that we can set aside really just be with us and God and praying. It's really important. Commit to increasing our knowledge of scripture and how to use it in battle. You know, like the like the um, Ephesians passage for the spiritual warfare. So we need to understand, you know, how scripture can help us. We also need to know that big picture of the Bible so that we can have that confidence in what God is doing 
and in what he'll do to help us in our lives. Commit to training in the defense of the faith. I think, you know, as part of this is this is a war we're in in this world. And so we need to be able to defend the faith when we're asked questions, when we're being attacked. We need to be able to be bold in our faith when it comes to our convictions. And so we need to train a little bit in that. And that's what you're doing if you're if you're following us in these classes. Um, develop a passion for recruiting teammates that will help us prepare and who will stand alongside us in the battle. And that goes to our discipleship point. You know, we need to do life with other Christians, but we also want to bring in other people to the team and help them so that they can continue the the battle, the fight, and we can grow our, our army, our Christian army, so to speak. Um, get in the game, know what you believe and why, and then share it with others. That should be a theme. As Christians, we must have a correct understanding of the spiritual warfare that is going on all around us. We have an opportunity to be part of God's team and help win battles here in this life. And again, Jesus will take care of that final war. And so we need to uh, we need to be in training constantly. All right. Um, you know, I stuck in one extra problem to share here or one extra question that sometimes goes with the problem of evil and suffering. Um, and that, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's that's another one I'm going to do. Excuse me. This is what is God going to do to solve the problem of evil and suffering? Well, let's talk about that first. And then I'll throw in that extra little question that sometimes comes up um, in conversations. And so we can point out a few things to help give us this big picture of what God is going to do to solve the problem of evil and suffering. He he actually put in place that rescue plan immediately after the fall in, for Genesis 3.15. When it happened, God immediately promised that he would have the seed of the woman. And so then we know we can trace that seed all the way through the Old Testament as it leads to Jesus. And he put a promise right into place and that unfolded throughout the entire Old Testament. We can see that promise from the original one grow through the covenants, through the events, through the law, through the things that were leading up to, through the, all the prophecies leading up to the time of Jesus. And then God's son fulfilled that rescue plan. Jesus fulfilled it on the cross to cover our sins. And, the, and, and he paid the price. He then paid the price due. And so, you know, we can, I reference a couple of verses that help us understand that. And you can check those out to see those fulfillments. But basically, Jesus said it is done to tell us that it is paid in full. Matthew 28 8 through 20 gives us the Great Commission. So, knowing that the Great Commission is our ongoing role during this period of grace until the return of Jesus, you know, God is not, He's not um, destroyed evil completely yet. Because we're in a period of grace, and that means God is allowing that period of time for those whom he knows will come to him before he ends it all. And so we have this period of grace right now. Um, John 14, chapters 14 through 16 teaches us all about the Holy Spirit, and Jesus prepares a place for us in his eternal home, gives us the Holy Spirit to guide us during our remaining earthly life. And so we need to ask for that. We need to, to be in prayer for that and to understand that Jesus has prepared a place for us. And that's where we're going. We need to have our eyes on that. And then the final battle is going to happen. It's We can read about it at the end of Revelation. And I know there's different people, different <laughs> people interpret Revelation differently in different ways and not to teach that book of Revelation right here. But I think if you just go and, and, read chapters 19 to 22 you can there's i don't think there's controversy in any interpretations about what's going to happen in the end jesus will return to set up his kingdom you see that final battle the conclusion to satan and his followers just as it was supposed to be from the beginning um you can study revelation on a whole chapters 1 to 22 we're blessed for doing that but i would encourage you just to understand that that end is promised and secured you know, so many of us want to study Revelation to see like, oh, is that what's going on right now? What's happening? You know, where are we in the time scale? And I, I don't think we're supposed to know that. Even Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the son, but only the father. And so talking about end times. And so we need to know it's going to happen. And we need to know that that's what Jesus is going to do. But in the meantime, remember, we have a job to do. We're, we're in the battle. 
And part of that battle is sharing the truth that we know from scripture and that we know about God and praying against and fighting against the spiritual warfare that's going on out there. And so I think that's, that's an important, important point. So again, know the big picture, know what God is going to do. Here's an important prayer for those who are going through tough times. We can't sit there when someone's suffering or, or grieving or going through something really rough um, and try to teach them all about the problem of evil. I know all the last, these three classes, you know, we can't just dump that on them. That's not where they are. Know your audience, you know, know who you're talking to, know what they need, be a good listener. But I think this would be a prayer to pray with anyone who's struggling. And for, for us to remember as well, be anxious for nothing. This is in Philippians. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It's a great prayer to share with someone who's struggling or suffering or grieving. Um, and even, you know, again, for ourselves, I love this one. Read that whole chapter. It's a really beautiful chapter. Read the whole book. Read the whole Bible <laughs> so you know the big picture. But that's a good one to share. Um, here's just some references of things if you want to go a little deeper on studying this the problem of evil. I had talked about Dr. Clay Jones's book, Why Does God Allow Evil? You know, I took that class from him. It's excellent. You can you can look him up on YouTube. He's done some presentations on it. Um, if you like C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis wrote about this in The Problem of Pain. Um, Greg Kokel does a lot of series of short videos, um, three minutes or less, on the topic of the problem of evil. He's he's a great Christian apologist. So I think he's he's somebody I really recommend and you can trust and you can learn from. Sean McDow McDowell as well, Sean McDowell, um, he does a, a talk on If God, Why Evil? He does a great job with that too, along with his father, Josh McDowell. Um, Jay Warner Wallace has a lot of stuff out there. He has an article and some clips and things on how eternity changes the problem of evil, really keeping our eyes on eternity, that this life is not you know, a line segment from birth to death, but it's a ray that goes on into eternity. And it's important to keep our eyes on that. And then, of course, like I talked about um, this evening, The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel, his the book you can read. It's excellent. Get it on DVD. You can stream it, I believe, on YouTube, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty, pretty sure you can. Um, all right. I I mentioned there was a last question or topic here. I just wanted to throw in because sometimes these things are brought up in, in reference to, you know, the problem of evil and people will say something like, well, what about those who never get a chance to hear about Jesus? You know, you Christians say Jesus is the only way. Isn't that evil? If they didn't get a chance to hear about Jesus, um, not so much. I, I, I think, you know, sometimes this sounds like a tough question, you know, how's everybody going to hear about Jesus? What about through the history of human time and stuff? And there's actually answers to this that, that are pretty simple, I think, if we just think about them. But I want to share a couple of things here. First of all, natural revelation. Natural revelation is creation, basically. The fact that Everything we see around us is so complicated, and we talked a lot about this in the evidence for, for God's existence, but just even our own bodies and the workings of our body, natural revelation can bring a person to seek God who may have no other means of evidence. In Romans 1, it talks about um, God has made it plain, so we are all without excuse. So a person who is really looks to the heavens and is really seeking God and says, God, I want to know you. God's word says, if you seek me, you will find me. I, I He's, he's going to make sure that they will. Um, God is omniscient. means He knows everything. He knows the beginning from the end, it tells us in Isaiah. So he knows who would come to him given a chance. He would never let a true seeker miss an opportunity to know him. God is also sovereign and is in perfect control of his creation and his decisions. Um, and true seekers, the miraculous happens, you know, people who look at creation and say, there's got to be a God, he's going to provide a way, he's going to bring missionaries into them, he's going to, you know, he may have a vision that he shares with them, 
Um, that happened to Nabil Qureshi. I love his testimony. Um, read his book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. But true seekers that have no other means can have visions and dreams. We have biblical references to a lot of that. And I, I listed some of those there, Psalm 9, 10, um, and 53, 2, Lamentations 3, 25, Matthew 7, 7 and 8, John 4, 23, John 5, 44, just to name a few. But for, for people's uh, testimonies concerning that, they're out there in plenty. And then again, I just I just heard a guy at our church this last week that had the same thing happen. You know, it's just the miraculous of where Jesus, um, uh, you know, in, in a vision or an angel or a situation where God confirms um, his word through those things. we got to be careful sometimes with, you know, was that an angel of God? What was that? You know, um, we need to check with scripture. But in these situations, we see people bring being brought to Jesus because of visions and dreams, then we know that's from God. And so that's, you know, my recommendation if you want to read about that, but God can do that. Now people will ask too, what about Old Testament believers before Jesus went to the cross? What happens to them? Well, Old Testament believers that put their faith and trust in God's covenant promise of a savior, which God promised, they received God's promise of salvation. They put that faith and trust in God and his, his promise, his covenantal promise. And so I think that's, that's an important point to remember. So those are some maybe helpful answers for you, for people that have that kind of a question. God knows who will come to him. Most importantly, whether Old Testament, New Testament, our times today, in the future to come, he knows he's omniscient. He's omniscient. And he knows. So trust in that. But here's just a few ways of maybe answering somebody who has that particular question. All right. Let's go ahead and head into our, our Bible study currently. And don't forget, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. Um, and I wanted to just real quick go over a few notes again as we're, we've gotten into the book of Deuteronomy. Um, last week, we began that. And so just to review a couple of helpful notes for us as Christians, Deuteronomy, just the, the name itself, it's the second giving of the Mosaic law to a new generation. Um, you're going to see a lot of repetition from Exodus, Leviticus numbers in this book because Moses is giving it to that new generation that's going to go into the promised land. We know that the old generation has died out with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. And so there's a there's an important importance to a repeating and a re-giving of the law and its and its um importance as they head into the promised land. Now, as Christians, we are not under the Mosaic law, We're not under this law, because it was given directly and specifically to the nation of Israel for three purposes. And we've talked about these, but just to review, they're given for ceremonial purposes, sacrifices and offerings. Um governmental or civic laws. This was a purpose to guide and keep this nation from chaos and to set them apart from all other nations. Just like we have laws for the United States, you know, that sets us apart from other nations. Um, they had their own laws. God gave them for governing. The moral laws to keep them pure and holy as representatives of God to the other nations. These are the ones we want to pay attention to, the purity laws, the moral laws. And most importantly, as Christians, and, and of course, that would mean like Ten Commandments, you know, those kinds of things. Anything Jesus taught that repeated something in the law, we are obligated to follow. And I emphasize this before, I just want to do it again, not for salvation. This is not a works-based mentality. If we've given our lives to Jesus, our trust in Jesus, um, we've been born again in that sense of a new spirit um, in Jesus, we've got the Holy Spirit. There's nothing we can do to work our way. There's no law we can follow that's going to get us, you know, into good graces with God or get us into heaven. And so we need to understand that it's not a salvational thing. But if Jesus taught it, when we love him for what he has done to, for us, he is our he is our God. He is our king. He is our our guy. I mean, he's our Lord and savior. Then we should have that much love for him that we want to follow the things that he taught. 
And he's, he said his burdens are light. His yoke is easy. There's not a heavy burden here in a, in a law that we should be following as, as Christians. And so, again, it's not for salvation. It's what we should do as Christians. All who believe and trust in Jesus are free from the penalty of the law because Jesus gave his life and then resurrected in defeat of death and Satan for the very purpose of covering us as a final fulfillment of that law. So that law also was to show that as humans individually, no one was going to be able to keep all of the holy perfection that God required, and therefore the need for a Messiah. That was, that was a huge purpose to the law that God was showing, not only the nation of Israel, but also for the rest of us to see what his expectations were and how hard it was going to be for individual sinful humans be, to be able to follow. So again, we do not have to do anything workspace to attain forgiveness and eternal life. It is a gift of grace we, re we receive by faith, not of ourselves, so that no one can boast. And that's in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And we can see that. So it's important to remember the law is not there for us to follow as Christians, but what Jesus taught and modeled in his ministry is there for us as Christians to be his representatives, just as the Israelites were, to the other nations, to other people. And it's all good. It's all good. It's what we should all be striving for. All right. So now you're going to take your study time and review uh, your homework for the book of Deuteronomy. So this week's homework was to do chapters 6 to 15. Remember, you're, you're sharing um, things that you've learned if you're just doing it on a basic level, you know, what was each chapter about? You wrote a title or more than one. If you wanted to go deeper, you took some notes to summarize the chapter and you can share that with your partners, study partners, and maybe you, you write some notes that you think are important you get from another person in your study group. And those that are you of you that are doing a more advanced study, you're looking for things that relate to, is there anything in there that relates to the covenants? And where's Jesus? Is there a picture or a foreshadow in a chapter that points to him? Not every chapter is going to have something, but I almost guarantee you there's going to be at least a few things in each of these homework assignments. And then the shelf, any questions or ahas you have about um, a chapter or the study in itself that you did this week. And before you hit stop, I just want to, um, and this is what we're working on is our survey format, which is what you're doing number four right now as you go through the entire book of Deuteronomy, when we're done with the book of Deuteronomy, then the application is discussed. So we always will do that last. But your homework for next week, I just want to share that real quick, and then you can click off and get into your um, review and, and sharing in your study. So next week, it's chapters 16 to 26, um, and you're doing the same idea. And then the week after that, we'll finish off the book of Deuteronomy with um, the application. All right, so I'm going to leave you there. I hope um, you have a blessed week. I hope you're spending a lot of time in the Word and getting that prayer time in. And remember, if you have questions or if you want to get the notes, um, go to the website, truthfaithandreason.com, and you can get those there. All right, I look forward to seeing you all back next week. I pray you have a blessed week again. Bye-bye.